Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, and welcome back to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by Trailtopia. This week, we're up to episode number 72 with our guest, Paul Magnanti, or Paul Mags. Paul is a real wanderer. He has such a refreshing take on the outdoors, and he's really a nomad, wandering where he fancies, and often for no other reason than that he just loves being outdoors. As many of my guests are introduced to me by other guests or listeners, I thought I'd mention my one-man booking agent, Clay Bonnyman evans Clay introduced me to Paul Meggs, and he continues to help me with the show in any way that he can. Thanks, Clay. We don't have Dr. Lynn on the show today, so I've decided to wear another one of those other trails. So, with Clay already part of the show today, I thought that I'd segue into his story about the Colorado Trail. It is more than just a walk in the park, being about 500 miles, but Clay gives us quite an insight into doing it, or even just a part of it, and I must say his description certainly piqued my interest. But before we get into that, who fancies a bit of... Dessert. Do you remember those days on the trail when you really need to treat yourself? You know, those days when you fall in the mud or the rain starts running down your neck, the rocks are driving you crazy, or even when you're just fed up. You need a boost, and when that happens, stop hiking, take off your pack, and treat yourself to one of Trailtopia's scrumptious desserts. Why not go for Rocky Road Pudding? A rich chocolate pudding loaded with mini marshmallows and toasted slivered almonds. By the time you get that into your system, you'll be warm, toasty and satisfied. Try Trailtopia Adventure Food. The best of home cooking away from home. <laughs> Let's get on to the interview with Paul Mags or Paul Magnanti. I was exhausted just by reading about his life. God knows what it must be like to actually live it. Paul is one of those people who is homeless by choice. His life wouldn't be for everybody, but his love of the outdoors is really infectious and clearly heartfelt. Here is Paul Maggs. Okay, I'd like to introduce probably one of the most experienced hikers we've ever had on the show. And this is our, well, we're over 70 editions. This is Paul Magnanti or Paul Maggs. Hi, Paul. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me on today. Not at all. And uh, with all this experience, uh, I feel a bit of an idiot asking you questions because you know, obviously, more about this stuff than virtually anybody. Um, uh, well, I think it well. <laughs> well, one of the first things that uh, you said to me when we originally spoke was that you're an outdoor person who happens to hike. So how does that actually manifest itself within your life? Um, I, I was drawn to through hikes initially as a way to spend more time outdoors, um, yeah. not realizing the, the big community around it. You know, I got involved with the community, but for me, it's about overall time spent in the outdoors, be it, you know, only four or five day backpacking trips or dispersed car camping somewhere remote or ski trips or what have you. I just love to be outside as much as possible. And sometimes through hiking is a good way to spend more time outside. So that's how that comes about. So what, so what are your outdoor uh, pursuits in? Um, backpacking, hiking are still by far um, my favorite way to spend time outdoors. Um, but I also love backcountry skiing, mainly ski touring, um, basically cross-country skiing on steroids. Oh, um, that's hard work. <laughs> oh, I, I love it, though. Uh, it's a great way to – to me, winter is not a uh, time to rest up. But it's another way to experience the outdoors. So I've really grown to love that kind of skiing. And um, some areas you can't backpack in, um, a lot of the ancient Puebloan areas. So I've really learned to enjoy dispersed uh, car camping in the middle of nowhere. It's a great way to experience a different area um, that you normally can't backpack in. Literally pulling off the side of the road and just getting yourself getting into a tent or sleeping in your car. Ex exactly. Um, especially like in some areas like the uh, High Plains, um, just to the east of here. It's not really a backpacking destination, but there's no one around. It's really remote. Uh, can be beautiful in its own way, and just sitting there, taking in the scenery, is a great way to experience that ecosystem. Are, are you um, by nature a bit of a loner, and have you always been, or do you just like? Is there something about solitude that, that you prefer? 
Well, you know, it's interesting dynamic by nature. I'm a, I'm a very outgoing social person. I have a large circle of friends, but for some reason, when I do outdoor activities, I like to be solo or one or two people at the most, even All having right. two additional people is kind of <laughs> unusual for me. Oh, um, <laughs> you might have a partner with me, but overall, yes, I enjoy my solitude. I think it's the most intense way to experience the outdoors. And I enjoy doing my own schedule, quite frankly. Um, I want to experience the outdoors my way and maybe a little selfish on my part, but as soon as you add another person or two or even three, it's all on your trip. It is a trip among different people. So the, the, the trip focus changes. Plus you're no longer looking as outward. You're looking within that social group as well. So for me, it changes the outdoor experience dramatically being in a group. Well, in my minor experience of, of hiking, one of the things I notice within days of being on the AT was that when two or three people were hiking together, the only person going at the correct speed was the person in front because they were hiking at their speed. The others were hiking at his speed, his or her speed. And and I and I I thought to myself, that's why I don't actually like hiking behind somebody because I'm having to walk at their pace and your pace your, or your rhythm of the hike is really important as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. It's just as hard to go slower than your normal pace as it is to go faster than your normal pace. So as soon as you have <laughs> your rhythm, the trip becomes much more difficult, I find, be it mentally or physically. Both. Yeah, and we've, we, have not, we have not spoken much about the rhythm of a hike on here, and I've spoken to people sort of offline about it, but I think the rhythm of the hike is something which is un- under, under-discussed because it's one of those things that you don't know it until you're into it, do you? Absolutely. And a lot of it depends upon where you're going to something like the Appalachian or Colorado trails very well maintained. You're going to keep a certain rhythm versus say off trail scrambling trips. You're going to keep a different type of rhythm as yeah, well. I'm sure. So do you regard uh, hiking as a, as a sport or a hobby? Because it seems to me that it's become something of a way of life for you. In some ways, but I always like to call it more of a, a passion than even a hobby at this point. Um, not an obsession. Yeah, other- Not an obsession. <laughs> Maybe an obsession as well. <laughs> passion or obsession, depending. A passion might be a better way of calling an obsession. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. A psychologist might call it an obsession. Uh, I'll call it a passion. How's that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but it's very much part of me at this point. Um, it's hard to separate from who I am. Um, a musician not playing music, you know, music is her passion. It's hard to separate from them. Uh, a well-known chef cooking is his passion, hard, hard to separate it from that. Yeah. So for me, the outdoors is very much part of who I am. It's how I identify myself in many ways. Um, if you're at, it's a very American thing. You go to a, uh, a, a gathering, people ask what you do. And they always, almost always mean your occupation to put yes. food on the table. Yeah. And I always kind of have a sly smile. Do you mean what I do for a paycheck or what I actually enjoy doing? That's how I phrase it. <laughs> It's funny, though. Most of us do actually have to chase the paycheck all the time. We're going to come back to that, what you do for that later on. Um, but is there a, is this a life that you share with anybody, or would there actually be room for somebody else? Because this is such a, a you thing, isn't it, that I wonder whether there's any room for anybody else to share that life. You know, that's a, a very good point. Um, uh, as I always said, I'm looking for um, – someone would be willing to do more of a flexible lifestyle. And that's um, certainly um, hard to find. What I found the people I tend to um, enjoy as a, a romantic partner rule, they have their own life as well. That's also flexible. Uh-huh. Um, so it's um, be a person who has their own life and sometimes um, wants to join me with mine. You know, they have their own separate lives and I'm um, good with that and expect the same on my end. So yeah. I guess that's a good way of putting it. Um, a traditional partnership probably wouldn't work as well. You know, marry with a white picket fence, as I found out in the past few years, but uh, that's another discussion. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, that happens. Uh, welcome to the club. Um, yeah. So how did how did you first come to hiking in the first place? Because there's something within you, obviously, that really loves this. I mean, with the passion, as you say. So how did you first actually discover it? Um, more by accident than anything. Um, I didn't grow up with the outdoors as part of my childhood. Um, I was in Boy Scouts briefly, but it wasn't very much an outdoor oriented Boy Scout troop. And, but one year they went to Mount Lafayette, New Hampshire. 
for pretty a Pretty good hike start. Pretty good start, isn't it, really? <laughs> if you're going to go hiking anyway, going up there must be so beautiful. Oh, it was amazing. I grew up in Rhode Island with the very thick hardwoods. And to go to this, for me at the time, especially this alien landscape above tree line, I've never experienced anything <sighs> like that before, you know, in my young life at 12 years old. And it was just amazing. I never <laughs> I, forget about that. Well, I, funny enough, I was, I, uh, since you mentioned that before you t- tell me what happens then, because I know that I, I that resonates so much with me. I, I recall that I knew that I would be going above tree line when I got to New Hampshire, and I'd thought about it, I heard about it. There is nothing on earth that could ever prepare you for that moment. You go above tree line for the first time, is there? Oh, it was just incredible. It made such an impression <laughs> on me at 12 years old, and I never, to this day, I you know never for, forget about that. It was probably one of those um, defining moments of my life. Um, yeah. Just a huge exclamation mark. Um among many other events, and that was way up there. And I kind of forgot about that moment a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, at 19, I did a local hike with my girlfriend at the time, um, southern New Hampshire, northern Massachusetts, called Mount Monadnock, um, very well-known mountain. And that kind of re-sparked it a little bit. Right. Um, then uh, my friend at the time took me on a backpacking trip when I was 22, and we got lost, carried too much food. Uh, <laughs> he forgot the map. Uh, typical... <laughs> comedy of errors but i still enjoyed it and uh, i took off more and more that summer went solo i uh, really enjoyed it because he was getting sick of me dragging him he wanted to be more of his girlfriend after a while like i spent <laughs> enough weekends with you i want to see nicole more okay so i started going solo of necessity um and i was hooked and i did the long trail the following year that was 97 and the appalachian trail in 98 and uh here i am 20 years later Wow. So, but what was it then? You you told us about the tree line above the tree line, and I that just totally does it for me as well. But what was in what was it about being in the woods that drew you in so much? Was it the adventure, or was it nature itself, or was it just you? Um. Yes, to all three. I guess um, the simplicity really I really enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed being able to do something on my own. Um, as far as I didn't require or. It, the resource was me. I had to do it. If I wanted to walk 10 miles, I had to do it. Uh, if I wanted to only walk five in camp, that was on me as well. It was very much something I could set the tempo for versus, say, you know, some people love hitchhiking as an adventure. I don't enjoy that as much. So this is an adventure I could control. Huh. Um, also, the fact that, again, it was a simplicity. I was just immersed in this really beautiful environment. It was quiet. Uh, just something just really drew me to it. I just really enjoyed being immersed in nature. When you go on a hike then, do you have a goal in mind to finish a certain distance or do you literally make up your mind or stop where you, when you want to stop and just take it in the whole time as opposed to say in eight days I'm going to do 128 miles or whatever it's going to be? Or do you just go along for where you want to, you know, stop where you want to be and stay there for a day maybe and then move on 20 miles the next day? Is that how you how you do it, or you just, or are you specifically goal oriented when you hike? It, it all depends on the trip. Uh, if I'm doing a longer hike where I have a, a finite amount of food and I have to resupply, I'm going to be more more goal oriented. I want to be roughly here, especially the type of trips I do now. Um, there's no da- data book a lot of times, but I know roughly I'll be here by this point. Um, the Utah trip, I want to be by the dirty. Devil River by um, twilight. So I'll kind of set that as a goal. Yeah. Um, as I'm looking at my Grand Gulch map, I just went to recently. That was a four day backpacking trip. I had a goal of mine, but because there were so many amazing Puebloan dwellings and petroglyphs, et cetera, et cetera, I just did what I felt like doing. So it was just so amazing to explore side canyons and these 800 year old buildings and 1200 year old pictographs etc so it's very yeah. much depending upon the trip but a lot of the through hikers we've spoken to i don't i think a lot of us and i and i count myself amongst them take as many of the side trails as we should do because they're there to be visited aren't they i, I missed out going over is it mount rogers there's a side trail up to the top of mount rogers it wasn't on the appalachian trail so i didn't take it you know, and so I kind of regret that. But you're that you're somebody who literally takes the time to look at things and smell the roses by the sound of things. And on some trips, uh, again, some trips more goal oriented. Um, 
I did the uh, collegiate loop this past September, um, just as kind of a break between my corporate job that I ended September 5th and this kind of nomadic lifestyle I'm doing right now. And that was more of a goal oriented trip where I just did the Colorado trail portion and didn't do side trips at all. Okay. I didn't do any 14ers or I hiked the Colorado trail through the collegiate loop and I did, you know, 20 miles a day or whatever I did. Nice. So it all depends. It's not always easy to walk out of your life and head off into the woods. How did you manage it the first time? I don't know what stage of your life you're at when you first did it. And then how do you manage it now? Just getting out, getting out and going into the woods. Well, um, you know, I was in my um, early to mid twenties is relatively easy. I hadn't really started a career by that point. Right, right. Um, I had saved money. Um, uh, very, uh, at least for my cultural background, very traditionally, you don't go away to college. You live at home to save money. Right. And, um, so I was able to save money that way relatively right. easily. Then I just did my Appalachian Trail through hike. When I came back, um, I, it was time for me to start my adult life. And I said, well, you know, I've seen enough of a different type of the world. I can't go back to my old lifestyle in Rhode Island. So I started moving to Colorado. I did that uh, kind of in a wing and a prayer back in 99. Wow, <laughs> that was risky. <laughs> yeah. What did you, yeah. you, fo- you folks think about that? Um. <laughs> So a little quick background. I'm one of 16 grandchildren on my mother's side. So a very close, <laughs> big, yes, very stereotypical Catholic family, I guess you could say. So everyone right. was within 10 minutes of each other growing up. Mm. I was the first of the grandchildren to leave the family fold and move um, 2,000 miles away. And that was just unheard of. So not only was it my parents, but my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. It's almost a tribal, <laughs> almost a tribal close-knit upbringing I had, the very close family friends. I may as well have moved to Mars. People, we, you just don't do that. Leave the family fold and community fold like that. Yeah. So that that was a huge, huge... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my mother, when she visited me for the first time in Colorado at the airport, she broke down crying in the airport. She did. And, uh, <laughs> and she Who said, she did? a son shouldn't do this to his mother. <laughs> <laughs> this, this very um, wonderful Catholic guilt my mother has perfected over over the years. <laughs> my wife will entirely yeah. understand that, by the way. <laughs> Being Catholic, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so and, how they rea- uh, how they react to this life now? Then do they they this is just Paul. This is what he does, and good for you. At this point, um, they've kind of accepted it. I think um, when I first did the Appalachian Trail, oh okay, you know, you get this out of your system. You move into Colorado. Um, okay. And then I got, um, my first, which we'll go back to later, my first IT job. Oh, he's settling down. That's great. Then when I quit to hug the Pacific Crest Trail in my late twenties, uh, my poor <laughs> grandmother said to my mother, isn't he a little too old for this? <laughs> and, uh, and then when I, uh, did the Continental Divide Trail, um, my mother was, you could say the attitude, well, as long as you're happy. And, uh, <laughs> you you clearly are though you you know you're living the you're doing what a lot of us I mean I'm 65 so my life was very much corporate and so on so you're doing a, what a lot of us kind of wish we could do doing what we want to do when we want to do it and making it work and and that actually is was actually going to be my next question how on earth do you manage this 20 years later you're still doing similar things you're effectively a freelancer who, who works to be outdoors aren't you Pretty much. Um, I stumbled upon a career, um, IT software, that, especially in the Colorado Front Range, is very lucrative right now. All right. Um, I have 20 years' experience in the field, so I can always find a job, as, you know, as long as the economy is doing well. Um, <laughs> that pays reasonably well. It's, just, it's a practical, hands-on skill set I'm very fortunate to have. So I'm able to work, save up money. I had a bit of um, a break for a while where I tried to do more of a traditional lifestyle and that didn't really fit me too well. So okay. here I am in my early forties, um, don't own a home. So I don't have a mortgage payment. Uh-huh. Um, um, my wife and I, at the time, we never had children, so I don't have that responsibility. So I'm able to have a lifestyle. Um, you know, years from now, I won't have the most luxurious retirement, but my needs are simple. So I always be able to, um, do what I think I love and keep it going. I, uh, with the skill set I have. Do you have what you regard as home? I mean, it sounds a stupid question, but is there somewhere you say, I want to go back and stay at home for four months? Where would you go? 
That is a good question because I my the least I'm. Uh, my last place expired in October, about the time I started taking off on the road trip. Um, I guess at this point, my home base is um, the Boulder, Denver area. Uh, I've been there for almost 20 years, but I don't have an actual um, facility to go back to. Uh, <laughs> I visited around Christmas. I was um, pretty much couch surfing, you know, guest bedrooms or what have you, trying uh-huh. to disperse myself around. So I want to be the house guest from hell who's been there for a week, but uh, <laughs> That that's home base at this point, um, but I don't have an actual home to come back to. You know what? So we'll see what happens. We're, we're, we're all taught when we're youngsters that's what you should aim for, and I'm I suspect your your mother did the same for you as well. But it obviously, you know, it takes for what quite a few of us we get involved in work, and then you find you're working to get the check, don't you? Every single time, and you've made that break and you kept it, which is you know good for you, as far as I can see. Well, that's what happened this past year. Um, it gets slightly personal. My marriage ended. It is what it is. So I was just yeah. working no longer um, with a partner. I'm like, why am I working all these hours? And right. work, um, it's not, it wasn't just me. Uh, corporate America demands more and more of your so-called free time. Yeah. And I'd have plans. And um, and I get along great with my old manager. He's a, he's a really good guy. He was in a bad position himself, of course, being middle management. But he said, well, because of business needs, we need you to alter your schedule for this. And I was implicitly implying that somehow my job is more important than my personal life. And like, you know, I have few needs. I have no debt. I have money saved. I'm going to fire myself and take a sabbatical. <laughs> Good for and, you. And I emphasize again, my manager is a great guy. So there's no hard feelings. He shook mm-hmm. my hand and he was a little envious, but he okay. totally understood when he quit. He's like, yeah. I had a feeling this was going to happen. He more or less said. <laughs> oh, dear me. So tell us about the, the, your big three uh, through hikes, uh, the uh, the Triple Crown. You said you did the AT in 98 and, um, and the PCT in 2002 and the CDT in 2006. Was that a deliberate plan mm-hmm. or did one automatically lead to, or naturally lead to the uh, the other? Um, it, by coincidence, it was every four years. I yeah. When I got the itch, had money saved up, felt comfortable financially to take off. Um. It could have been three years, could have been five. It's just, that was just how it fell, as much by coincidence. Um, the Appalachian Trail I did just because I wanted to spend, you know, five months out in the woods and see this historic path, and it was wonderful. Then that's what led me to move to Colorado. Then I started getting the itch. I, you know, working during the height of the dot-com boom, had money saved up, and yeah. my company got bought out that year. And they said, oh, we'd love to give you a job. Um, you have to move to Portland. And I said, no, I'm going to hike the Pacific Crest Trail instead. It's a good time. So that was a coincidence <laughs> then. And I've always, 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 always wanted to do the CDT because living in Boulder, you could see the continental divide behind Boulder. I mean, right. that is my backyard. Right. And it's always dreamy. I mean, the his, history is my background. So the history behind the contents of the divide, what it means for America, it's such a um, iconic landscape too. you know, the great divide. Yeah. I'm um, just so much drew me to it on a, you know, a, li- a literary level, a historic level, the outdoors level, the most wild remote of the big three trails, which really appealed to me and my love of solitude and you know, obscure remote places. So, and again, about the right time uh, where I was working was going through transition. So, 2006 seemed a great time to quit and do the CDT. Mm. And that was also the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark at that time too. So history being my background, it, that uh, understandably drew me as well. So All everything right. just timed well for doing the CDT. So, so did the CDT live up to your expectations? Absolutely. Um, it was the most remote, wild, um, raw of the big three trails I did. And uh, it's um, I loved all the trails equally. Uh, but for different reasons. It's like asking to choose between a child. But the CDT was definitely the most remote and wild of three by far. Wow. So you so you did the Triple Crown, not act- actively pursuing the Triple Crown, but it became another trail for you to hike. Because I look at your list of hikes you've done, um, run through them quickly, the the, the long, long trails you've done or the longish trails that you've done. So a long trail in 97 is kind of a, seeing if I can enjoy being out for multiple weeks <laughs> um into it yes i did the long trail again 99 it was kind of my farewell to new england before i moved to colorado All right. that's why i did that again um 
it was just, I just liked the long trail. It was really a great experience. Um, um, AT, of course, PCT did the Colorado trail in 2004, which is a great way to see my adopted home state. Um, I could do that in a vacation time. And then when I got laid off, um, you know, when the economy imploded, I did the Bent Mackay trail in 2009. That was uh, just a marvelous way to see the Southern Appalachians. Um, it was fantastic. I really, how long long is the Bent Mackay trail then? Um, if we do the approach trail of Springer Mountain and I hike to, um, a hostel just outside of Smokies, it ended up being 300 miles nice. um, exactly for me. So it was a great way to see the Southern Appalachians off the, you know, it was off the beaten path compared to the nearby Appalachian Trail. And oh, I highly recommend it. Did you find it quite a, uh, a, 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 the path less trod, whatever it is, the expression you use, was it really quite a solitude, um, tra- a trail for you? Yes. Um, other than road crossings and yeah, um, the yeah, small yeah. little town, I saw six people, and that was in towards the end at the Smokies. Oh, wow. Blimey. Now, <laughs> that's, that's not a lot, is it? <laughs> now, granted, I did it in uh, mid to late February, so a little early. But from what I heard, people do in March or even April, very similar until you get to the Smokies, of course. Actually, that was the other question I intended intend to ask you earlier on. So when you go out, you just like being outdoors. Does the weather matter to you, or were you hiking cold or hot and doesn't make any difference to you? Um, you know, of course, I, I fall is my favorite time. If I could have long days of summer come out in fall weather, I'd be the absolute <laughs> happiest if I had to pick an optimum time. But I do just love being out in all the seasons and conditions. You know, of course, if it's a rainy, cold day, I might – do a little less hiking and uh, maybe go into town a little bit earlier, of course. But yeah. I find beauty in all conditions and all seasons and all environments. I, I just love to be outside. Um, I guess that's the main overreaching arch. It's just I love being outdoors. Now, I know you did this walk across Utah, you actually called it. Um, mm-hmm. How did that come about? Is there a starting point or you just chose to start at a certain point and you chose to start, finish at a certain point? And is, and is it actually a trail? Well, the, how it came about is that I wanted to do a longer walk. It's been a while since I've done a multi-week. I've done you know up, almost up to two weeks in the past few years, but I haven't done a true multi-week hike. I wanted to do something a little more off the beaten path. I was thinking... Yeah. Uh, the Grand Enchantment Trail or, you know, the Hey Duke's been back around, but I didn't want to be, um, <laughs> I just want to do my own thing. I didn't want to do something that's on a Facebook group and is, you know, a lot, social media around. I just wanted to be Paul out walking in Utah. And <laughs> I stumbled upon this um, Jamal Green. Um, I forget. It's just across Utah.com. He calls it the suggested route across Utah. Oh, and interesting. It really ch- really intrigued me and he has all these alternates and this other uh couple uh really fascinating website miles.com they do all kinds of great journeys themselves okay sorry can and, you re- uh, repeat that website so i'll put it on put a link on the show notes what's the name of the website sure uh jamal green across utah.com uh-huh. okay and there's um amy and james doing miles.com okay cool thanks and, and they both did these walks across Utah. And uh, cooking is the other thing um, I really enjoy. I just, uh, Italian-American family, who just really grew up <laughs> with cooking, the culture yeah. of food. And the reason why I relate to this is that they had the basic recipes posted, if you will. And it wasn't a set route or a set trail. I can mix and match their basic recipes and add my own ingredients to make my own route across Utah. Wow. And that's what I did. Uh-huh. Using a lot, I mean... They had a lot of resources, but I certainly modified it for my needs. Um, And I was able to do this track where uh, national parks had single track, of course, but everything else is cross country or Jeep roads or barely Uh, well-known social trails, more among canyoneering people than hikers. Um, It was just wild and remote, um, some scrambling and a lot of orienteering. You head in a certain direction. I presume you use a compass and a map then, do you? Yes. Um, and of course, being uh, 2017, I also made use of, um, you know, my phone GPS. Um, Did you so really? Canyon, uh, <laughs> well, you're a traditionalist. Well, uh, more for the map, because the amount of maps you need, because even the uh, 124,000 scale topos don't have quite the detail you need. Sometimes I have to zoom in to the 112,000 scale in those canyons. And wow. I could not 
physically carry that. I mean, this was 10 years ago. I'd have to carry that many maps. Um, but now I, I always map and compass is my go-to. I'm kind of old fashioned in that way, but, um, not going to lie that, um, the, having those other additional maps on my phone helped a lot as well. It's like the Scottish author, uh, Chris Townsend. He's the one who really got me thinking differently about phones. Here's this very accomplished, um, outdoor writer who's done all kinds of amazing adventures. And he basically said, look, the phone is a tool. Um, it's how you use the tool that really matters. And that got me thinking about my own prejudices against using uh, a phone GPS. I'm like, well, I should use this tool as a modern outdoors person. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I started gravitating towards learning to use the phone GPS as another tool in my kit. It was interesting, actually. You said earlier on, and I, I, thought, I thought about modernism and the way in which I, I'm sure hiking the AT must have dramatically altered or already long distance trail dramatically altered since the advent of the of the iphone i guess and you, you sounded you didn't, didn't want to go on a on a hike that was part of a facebook group is are you do you like other hikers do you like to meet other hikers or do you not buy into some of this i don't know um there's so much stuff on facebook about hiking and so much back and forth about what the right way to do something is and what the wrong way to do something is i sometimes wonder whether social media actually doesn't do good for hikers and i wonder if you had a thought on that well i mean i love i have great friends i met through the hiking community um a really really good friend of mine um dilo is his nickname his last name is de lorenzo we met in the pct i was uh, the best man at his wedding he ended up moving to boulder um I, I always hang out with him when I'm back in town. I know his children very well. So I, I obviously enjoy meeting hikers. Yeah. But as far as the social community aspect, um, I enjoy the informational part of it. Um, I'm not really into what I call as the world turns drama. <laughs> as much. Um, I, I, I very, try well, to, very well put, by the way. <laughs> but well, I know, and I know you, exactly you. what you mean. I know precisely what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't really want to get involved in that because, again, I, I'm more, and this just goes back to what I said before, I'm more of an outdoors person who happens yeah. to through hike. So yeah. I, I love educating. Uh, maybe that's the, the history background. Um, I love discussing the philosophy of the outdoors, you know, wildness versus wilderness, et cetera. Yes. But as far as, you know, what, uh, what Raman Wanderer said to, you know, Charmin Rocket, I don't know, making up trail names there on purpose. Um, I, I just, it's not of, of interest to me. It, I'm not really into the <laughs> social aspect when on the trail. Now, mm -hmm. meeting friends off the trail, I'm at my uh, friend's house here in Moab. It's been great catching up and talking, discussing the outdoors, etc. cetera. Um, I have some other through hiker friends I love catching up with. Um, we email fairly regularly, but it's about the personal relationship we have as opposed to about the through hiking community we happen to have shared in the past. Yeah. So what is, what has all your hiking taught you about life and what has it taught you about yourself? Um, uh, especially as I get older, I, I realize even from the beginning, I've always just enjoyed the simple pleasures of life. I mean, uh, drinking a hot cup of coffee while watching the sunrise or enjoying walking into the twilight, seeing that wonderful colors of the setting sun. Yeah. Um, Etc. And I just realize it really is the simple things I enjoy about life, and I need simplicity in my life. Um, um, it goes back to kind of how you asked how I was able to do these longer treks in my current road trips. Um, sure. I keep my life simple. I'm able to do what I enjoy in life, um, and that's partially why I quit my job because a lot of people, I think, get involved. Especially I was working in a corporate environment. You know, they don't have a lot of time to enjoy the things they enjoy. So they buy the brand new car. They buy the really, really big screen TV. They take the exotic vacations. I, I think it fills something in life they can't do otherwise. They don't have the time. So by driving an older car, by um, not going out to eat every day and, and concentrating on the simple things, I'm able to um, enjoy what I happen to enjoy doing long term which is the simple parts of life taking a walk in the woods if you will yeah well yeah I, i'm sure a lot of people people will be uh agreeing with you smiling nodding their head but probably thinking i'd love the idea of that i just couldn't do it 
Um, and, and that's good for them as well because you've chosen this and it's beca- the fact that it's become your passion should tell everybody that wh- whatever they need to know about how you feel about this because you obviously love it and it works for you. These are the choices I made for my life. I don't claim they're the best choices for everyone. I'm not going to claim that it's somehow better than other choices. For example, I don't have children. Some people are extremely yeah. happy, love being a parent. That's a choice I didn't make. I'll never experience. I don't know sure. if that would have been a better choice for me or not. Uh, at this point, that ship has sailed in many ways. I don't want to start a family in my early to mid-40s. <laughs> but the choices for me aren't necessarily going to be the best choices for everyone. Some people get a lot of enjoyment out of their career. For me, it was just a um, a white-collar trade job working in IT. It's not my avocation. Someone who is a um, – I have a friend who's a professor of physics. Um, that is his avocation. He absolutely loves that career. That was yeah. a better choice for him. So it all depends yeah. upon the person. Absolutely, it does. And uh, you, have, you make your choices, and you certainly have. So where do you where do you go next? What's your next big trip? Well, I'm currently in the middle of a road trip, just cherry picking different areas. Um, we'll see how long I can keep that going for. But um, batting around the idea of um, early summer, uh, depending upon the finances slash um, how, how much longer I want to keep this going, uh, possibly um, going to, I've never done what I think was a cultural hiking trip. I'm possibly thinking of going to Italy, nice. start in the Alps, work my way to the Apennines, work my way down to the toe. Um, just the culture, the history, the food, obviously my own ethnic background, look at my, my roots. I met some of my grandfather's cousins about a decade ago. So I have a little bit of a connection there of people I've met nice. and it'd just be a really interesting trip. I think a great way to explore the roots. Um, my own grandfather fought there in world war II for the American army and worked his own way up the Apennines in a much different way, of course. <laughs> so I'd be exploring some of the areas where he went to as a young man as um, a ch- child of immigrants seeing where his own parents came from. That's kind of pay my respects to my grandfather as well. Um, it'd just be an interesting cultural trip, I think, on many well, levels. I, I drove from England back in 2004 all the way through France under the Alps and then all the way around Italy. I lapped Italy, and it is the most beautiful place. It's obviously the, the way I did it was the lazy man's way to do it. You're going to be uh, – the uh, tough man's way of doing it. But uh, you're like, going to absolutely love it. The food is fabulous and the people are fabulous and the scenery is beautiful. Oh, what well, little I've seen of it ten, roughly 10 years ago, um, it was just fantastic. Um, I was able to go my own immediate ancestry uh, from the Nyanti branch of the family is actually in a mountain village. And what uh, I saw of it, the rolling green hills and the old buildings and the very old chapel and, of course, the food – uh, was delicious, and I also learned how bad my Italian really is. So I'll work on that a little bit. <laughs> oh dear. Well, look, it's been an absolute joy talking with you. You are unlike virtually any hiker we've had on here. You really, really oh, do yeah. it. And, and I think your story is something that's going to be interesting for people. And I'm there. You got a bunch of links. I'm going to add to the show notes as well. And I really appreciate that you taking the time to have a chat with us. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I love talking about the outdoors, and uh, it's been an honor as well to talk to you. Appreciate it. All the best. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs> Raman Wanderer, Shaman Rocket. I love those trail names. Isn't he a bloke who seems to have prioritized his life to his liking? Hiking a lot or doing even just one long distance trail is a choice, but it's also a deliberate decision to leave part of your life behind. Not everybody has the capacity to do this, but Paul has engineered his life to make it work for him. And it isn't just living like a hobo and wandering aimlessly. Paul picks up on the history of hiking and totally absorbs himself in it. Of course, there are trade-offs. No wife, no kids, no home. But it works for him. He's bought into the simplicity of his life and he sounded a whole lot happier with his choices than many people I've met over the years. It's all about spending time outdoors for Paul, so good for him. And he did the Colorado Trail which is a perfect segue to Clay Bonham and Evans and our conversation about that trail. Here is Clay. Okay, we're back with an old friend of the show, Clay Bonham and Evans. Hi, Clay. How are you? Hey, Steve. How's it going? <laughs> it's not too bad. And uh, thanks for stepping forward to doing this. This is uh, one, one somebody suggested that we speak to others who have done other trials than the AT, um, particularly some of the shorter ones. But yours is one of the 
shorter, longer ones, if you know what I mean, at about 500 miles long. You're going to tell us about the Colorado Trail. So when did you actually do that trail, Clay? Yeah, I, I hiked it in July of 2015. And how long were you on the trail for? I was actually on the trail for 24 and a half days, and that included three zero days. Oh, my word. So that's I'm just trying to work the mileage out. Yeah. So, so how did you find how did you find the trail then? Because the the thing for me is always going to be elevation. So I know I would never be able to do it. So talk me to talk to me about the trail. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I, I was living in Colorado where I was born and raised and everything. And there's a young woman who grew up next door to me in the small town of Niwot, and she was by then in her late twenties, and she had been working very hard as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And in the summer of 2014, she just got a wild hair and she left her job and she took her job, uh, took her dog, Jude, and decided to hike the trail. Now, I knew about the trail and I knew about through hiking. I'd done some journalism about through hiking um, in various ways. But, you know, it sort of didn't really occur. I don't know why it didn't really occur to me to do it. And Sparkle (laughs) was her trail name. And I just found myself hanging on every little post and photo and word that came from her. I don't know why, but I was Uh utterly smitten, smitten with her experience. And then she shows up four or five weeks later and she's tan and live and her dog has, you know, is as fit as he's ever looked. And I said, man, that seems like it would be a lot of fun. Uh But weirdly, I didn't decide to do it until I went and saw the movie Wild about (laughs) Cheryl Strayed's hike of the PCT. And I was sitting there, I was about 10, 15 minutes into that movie with my wife and a light bulb just exploded in my head. We walked out of that movie and I turned to Jody and I sort of cleared my throat and I said, Hey, um, and she said, I know, I know you're going to go do that, aren't you? And I said, oh, no, 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 it's not nearly that bad. I'm just going to do the 500 mile Colorado Trail. <laughs> True story. Oh, dear. dear me. So how long after you saw the movie, did you actually go and do the hike? Yeah, I saw the movie around Christmas time. And then I lit out. Um, I had really the best six months of my entire life, those next six months for a variety of reasons. And I lit out, uh, I started on July 2nd uh, from Waterton Canyon, which is basically at the southwest corner of, of metropolitan Denver. Um, is that, is that nice. the official, it's, is that the official start of the trial? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it, the trail starts right there and you can hike it northbound or southbound. Uh, if you hike it northbound from Durango, your first day, you will be, ga- of course, depending on how many miles you do, but you will be gaining, I don't know what it is, 7,000 feet or something. Oh, insane. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So the va- yeah, the vast majority of people go southbound because it's a really gentle, and I mean super gentle start. Like the first six miles are very gradual grade along the South Platte River into the mountains. And then, you know, you start getting some hills and stuff. But so so what elevation, know, hang on, what elevation do you actually start at then, Clay? Yeah, it's, I don't know exactly, but it's going to be about 5,500 feet. All right, so not too bad. like that. Um, That's a pretty good yeah, start. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so that moves on for about five or six miles. And then when do you start hitting the real, the real heights? Because you were used to, living in Colorado, you were okay with heights anyway, weren't you? Altitude anyway, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm very fortunate. I guess maybe it was just having been born with not enough oxygen in my brain or something. I, I do pretty well at those <laughs> higher altitudes. So, um, yeah, it you know it takes off after those first six miles, and you're climbing up and everything. But you don't get up super. I mean, and I don't even want to say super high, but your first real real high point is Georgia Pass, and that's at about oh eighty miles, seventy five, eighty miles, something like that. And you get up above 11,000 feet on that path. So, you know, you're definitely getting a taste of altitude there. That's interesting. So you actually start at 55, which is certainly doable for most people. I'm, to be honest, I'm just thinking out loud because I'm, yeah. you know, obviously I, I struggle to a climb zone. So you're going to be walking for 70 or 80 miles, which is probably going to take you several, well, four, five, six days, seven days, uh, yeah, right. getting, getting acclimatized while you hike, I, I presume, don't you? Yes, exactly. And, and that's one of the reasons why – 
I think it's such a great trail for people just to kind of get a taste of what it's all about is that if you go southbound, it's just a really gentle introduction nice. to what you're, you know, what you're doing. And if there are no steep, crazy ass steep hills um, <laughs> until you get, you know, if you get, you get to Georgia pass, but I have to be honest with you, Steve, that what I thought was steep on the Colorado trail uh, would have just been a middling hill on the Appalachian trail. So really, because the AT, you know, the AT is crazy steep, and most of the co- the vast majority of the Colorado Trail uh, is really nicely graded. Another reason I think it's a really really great trail for people to start on. So you're not getting these just jagged ups and downs like you do on the AT. <laughs> um, it, it's a lot gentler. Um, big parts of it. Um, in fact, most parts of it, except for certain wilderness areas, people can ride bikes on it. You don't see many, thank goodness, yeah, but yeah. people take horses, you know, all these things. So really the grade overall is extremely forgiving compared and are, to... Are, and there are campsites, are there designated campsites and shelters and things like that? There, there really aren't. There, there's one shelter, which is weird, and I passed it and it was in my little guidebook and I had no idea what to think about it. It's a, It looks like an AT style shelter, it's a three-sided thing. I'm like, well, <laughs> what the hell is that for? I had no idea. <laughs> So no, you're. But there are there are you know, it's it's stealth camping, but not really. I mean, there are obvious yeah, places yeah. where people set up to camp, and then people just set up in many different places. And and you can camp virtually. There's very very little of that trail where you can't just stop and throw up your tent. I would say ninety eight percent of it. I think it goes through just a tiny bit of private property. Wow. And how high, how high does it eventually go? The highest it gets, and oddly on that day, it doesn't seem high because you're just on kind of a high, bald hillside. It's like a Rocky Mountain version of a bald. There are no trees or anything. Well, you're above tree line, but it doesn't yeah. feel high. It's 13,200 wow. feet. Wow, that is that is still, that's still pretty high. <laughs> Crikey. Yeah, so, it and, is. And I remember you talk, talking to me about this the, um, some time ago, about the – the views here, you said you're just you're you got views all over the place. Um, talk to yeah, us about I that. Mean, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's another reason that I just recommend this as a trail for people to kind of get their feet wet. I mean, you know, the AT is different because we're enclosed by trees so often, and, yeah. and, and you know, you kind of have to work for your views. Let's put it that way. Yes. I would say the the Colorado Trail is a slut for views. You're going to get <laughs> spectacular views every single day and and most hours of most days. Now, you're going to be in the forest a little bit. There are two routes. There's the Collegiate Peaks Wilderness. You can go westbound on that. That's a newer part of the trail. Um, and that takes you up to some alpine, you know, a lot more up and down, and you're, you're up pretty high. The, the original eastbound way um, is, is a bit through the forest and so forth. But even then you're looking out over the Arkansas Valley and you, it's almost eye candy. I mean, you will get eye candy every couple hours at a minimum and frequently all day long. Wow. Now I know after you did that, you then, the year later, I presume it was the year later, you did the AT, didn't you? That's right. Were you spoiled for the AT? Were you expecting more out of the AT or was it just, just an entirely different experience compared to the Colorado trial? <laughs> Well, the main thing, I hate to admit it, but it's totally true, is I was exceedingly cocky about the AT. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Colorado kid. I came from the Rocky Mountains. I've hiked in the Sierras. I know what <laughs> big mountains are like. I'm not joking mm. that in our, in our elementary schools in Colorado, they say, oh, well, those eastern mountains, they're, they're old and gentle and they're all worn down. So I literally came to the AT thinking I was King Hell. And I was going to kick its butt and I would just stroll along. And I have to tell you, within hours, I was absolutely gobsmacked by what the AT was. And I thought, well, okay, well, it can't be this steep. It can't be this much up and down the whole way. This is just, (laughs) this just happens to be right here. Uh, So to me, physically, the AT just wildly, wildly surpassed the, the gentle, you know, uh, my deflowering on on the CT was extremely (laughs) gentle and sweet and lovely. And, 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 and the AT is sort of like a much more brutal uh, affair, I would say all around. And I love them both. I love, 
I love They're the just different. because I started yeah. there. But yeah, yeah. Totally. The thing is, the thing is, you know, and I hadn't realized this. This this has been in my mind from the from the second we started talking. You were saying about the way it starts at fifty five hundred and gradually goes up to seventy or eighty. That makes it very yeah. accessible. And this this thing about accessibility is so important to me. You know, you know, the fact that somebody can start on it and really get themselves up to speed, as it were, with altitude, I think is a very attractive proposition because I've seen some amazing pictures. From the uh, C- from the CT, I think one or two of yours, and also uh, Aaron McKenzie had some on on the CT as well. Oh, so. Aaron, yeah, and all yeah. the dogs, exactly, yeah, <laughs> and Aaron, all the dogs. Aaron did the Aaron did the trail again this last. I summer, know she and did. I was out there. I was out there meeting a friend who was hiking the CT that I'd met on the AT, and I met her in Salida. And Aaron sent me um, a text message, and it just didn't it just didn't work out. I I, I wanted to to meet up with her, but I, I wasn't in the area where she was. Uh, I I just think it's it's beautiful. It's not going to kill anybody physically. It's not that it's easy. It's hard to hike that far. And and the other real advantage is that you know again I think going out for a hundred miles is great. I just did it. I just went back to the AT couple of weeks ago and did right. 100 miles and you know it, it's nice but a lot of the through the, the cdt the cdt conjoins with the ct for about 250 miles so uh-huh. i met a lot of cdt hikers and a lot of them said you know the weird thing about the ct to us is that to us long distance hikers you don't really 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 get your rhythm and get your sort of trail self in place until six seven hundred miles i tend to agree with that but I also think that 500 miles is plenty of time for a person to get an understanding of, hey, do I like this? Do I like yes, going up a yes, tent for five agree. nights and, and going into a trail town and, yeah. and, and handling the weather and this and that? I, I just I can't speak highly enough of the CT. I, I just think she's beautiful. Well, two last questions. Uh, the same thing, actually. Water and food. How accessible is getting water and how accessible is food? Yeah, in Colorado, uh, on the CDT or the CT, whatever, same with PCT, it, a lot of it's dependent on what the snowpack was right. in the spring. I went, right. in, I went in a really great year. Uh, I had zero water troubles. The very last couple sections down toward Durango get a little drier. Um, okay. I never ran into problems. But so if it were a drought year, it might be trickier, but in a, in a normal snow year or a good snow year, no problem at all. And then okay. what was the second thing you asked? Food. What about food? Getting food. Food. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there are great trail towns and they are spread out kind of roughly. I mean, it depends on how fast you go, but there are choices. You know, you, you can hit a, a trail town after a couple, three days and then nice. five, six days and all this. And, and there's some nice hostels and people who get what you're doing because CDT people are coming through. There is a long stretch, uh, after you cross Highway 50 of, you know, it, I don't remember 107 miles between sort of major towns unless you want to do a major, major hitch. Right. So there's a long stretch there, which is sort of comparable, I think, to the longest stretches on the PCT. But it's it's very friendly, easy to do. And if you if you wanted to, in fact, my friend um, Vasa, who I met on the AT, did the CT last year, and he did he did hitchhike 33 miles into Gunnison um, <laughs> in that long stretch. You know, so you you can do it if you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's great. I I, I had no idea to be honest with you, and which shows to my ignorance as much as anything else. But I'm sure a lot of people listening will realize from talking to you or listening to you that this this is an accessible trail, um, and the the thought of altitude starting at 5500 really sticking with me straight away. Um, so thanks very much indeed for doing this. I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll speak again soon, no doubt. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. Now, that was interesting for me. As you may recall, we had Erin McKenzie on the show last year telling us how she hiked the Colorado Trail with her three dogs after the tragic death of her beloved Chevy. In my mind, I had the image of a trail constantly over 10,000 feet, rugged as hell, and thus inaccessible to somebody like me. As you know, I don't do so well at elevation. Clay made it sound awesome. The first 80 or so miles are at reasonable elevations and great views all around. If I were preparing for a long distance hike, I think the Colorado Trail would be right near the top of the list. 
please try to think of more trials that you have done that you think our listeners might like. Call me up, tell me where it is, and I'll go ahead and record you. Now, I normally only read out five-star reviews on iTunes, though, to be fair, we mainly get five-star reviews. That said, I wanted you to hear from OBX Wingnut. He gave me four stars, and he says, Good show. Could be great. Nice start, I thought. He goes on, I really like the show. I'm on episode 44 and plan to catch up binging at work. Only two things bother me. Sound quality, (laughs) the overused or fake laugh. As you can see, I'm doing that right now. Steve really struggles with sound issues and it hurts the flow of the show. He also laughs entirely too much and it doesn't sound sincere. Aside from that, love the interviews and especially the audiobooks. I think you're right about a few sound issues, OBX Winner. But laughing too much? I'm a happy guy. I laugh a lot. But just for you, I will try my hardest to get a little bit more miserable in the future. It could be worse, mate. I could be this bloke. I heard that as a kid, and as soon as I read that review, I just had to record it. But I certainly do take on board the sound issues, OBX wing that, and I will try to do better. Mind you, I think it has got better over recent months, so maybe you just need to catch up. I learned something new this week. Did you know that if you've got an iPhone, you can simply press the home button and bring Siri onto the scene and say, Hey Siri, subscribe me to the Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail podcast. Do you know what? She does. She'll even tell you that you're already subscribed if you are. I learn something new every day. Next week, I'm hoping to have, now I can't pronounce this terribly well, Laurie Podiger? Podiger? <laughs> she told me several times when I spoke to her before, but Laurie Podiger, Podiger from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. We haven't actually recorded it yet, but she's agreed to do it. She's been away for a week and I'm hoping she can fit me in over the next few days. Last week, on Earl Schaefer's Walking with Spring, I might have appeared that I cut you off in mid-paragraph. The reason it felt that way was because I couldn't find a natural break, but we resumed this week just before Port Clinton with that dizzyingly steep downhill, then on to leave Pennsylvania and into New Jersey. I'll see you next week. Climbing Club which was formed by a hundred businessmen of Reading about 1920 and had built the original trailway between Lehigh and Susquehanna rivers. Danny Hoke was long-time president of the club. About two miles beyond Pilgaroo, a sign at trailside said, Showers 500 steps, with a side trail branching to the right. This was puzzling at the time, but is perfectly logical. Lloyd Showers, a local resident and a member of Blue Mountain Eagle Climbing Club, had shifted boulders on a rock slide to form a rough stairway down the mountain to the Bethel Pine Grove Road. People came from far and near to see this place. Farther along was Hurtline Cabin, in a well-watered cove. Camp gear was scattered around, and voices from downstream led me to a pool where three young men were swimming. They offered to make room in the shelter, but I preferred sleeping in the woods in good weather. In the morning, they helped clean up the mess left by previous occupants and even helped lay a stone walk across a swampy spot to the fireplace. They left in the direction of Shower's steps, while I cruised eastward, soon coming to a long, straight stretch of forest road. Along it was Pine Spring, so cold my teeth ached after a few swallows. Crushed stone had recently been spread on the road, each load coloured differently. The little black notebook says the stone might have been taken from a petrified rainbow. The trail led on. From a high point overlooking the Schuylkill River, I looked down on Port Clinton. The birthplace of Daniel Boone is a few miles south of the town. As a boy, he hunted and fished this area, and in one instance he ventured through the gap into the far valley and stayed so long his family and friends went searching for him, finally locating him by spotting smoke coming out of a thicket. His family moved south when he was about 15. He visited the homestead twice during the 1780s. It is now maintained by the government as a historic site. The post office in Port Clinton was closed, so I camped beyond town in a charcoal flat, intending to return in the morning. Late at night, a violent gust of wind and rain swirled through the forest and was gone as suddenly as it came. 
This reminded me of Zane Gray's description of Louis Wetzel, the border fighter who made such a sound when attacking an Indian camp in dead of night. They called him Deathwind. The home of Zane Gray was along the Delaware River, not far from the Appalachian Trail. In the morning I bought supplies and mailed film to be processed. Foggy rain moved in as I came to Windsor Furnace and the side trail to Pulpit Rock Pinnacle. In better weather, the view from there is panoramic across the Dutch country of southeastern Pennsylvania. The trail turns north across the valley at Eckville. Suddenly, a violent thunder gust roared out of the westward valley and I climbed the far, far mountain in sloshy boots, soggy poncho and drippy rain hat. I even stopped once to wring out my socks. At the summit was Dan's Pulpit, named for Congressman Hoke, who first introduced the Trail Bill. Danny was one of the first of the trail people I met after the long cruise. A side trail in this vicinity leads to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Rock ledges on the crest cause an updraft and migrating hawks and eagles swoop low to ride the wind. Years ago, men came with guns to shoot the birds, slaughtering them by the thousands. Laws were passed but probably came too late. Like the mighty condor, almost extinct because of prestige killing, the hawks and the eagles are dwindling year by year. Beyond Dan's pulpit, the real storm of the day arrived. The little black notebook says it rained as fast as the air would let it fall, while I stumbled along the rocky trail, feet sloshing, water trickling down my neck and telling myself I had to be crazy to start this Ridge Runner marathon in the first place. That made the consensus practically unanimous. Rain still fell as I side-trailed to Allentown Shelter and was surprised to find it occupied by three boys. They were celebrating the closing of the school year but looked mighty sorry right then. They'd lit a fire in the centre of the shelter with the last of the firewood. Then came another surprise, arrival of Clarence Stein, father of one of the boys. He had become worried for good reason. Mr Stein and I then ventured out to the wet woods to gather wood doing a good deed for the Boy Scouts. The roof leaked, but morning finally came. They soon left for home, but I remained, to reorganise and dry out a little. The weather was beautiful now, as I started off over brush-choked trail. Once a slight movement ahead stopped me short. It was a grass snake, green as the foliage around it, sunning itself on a huckleberry bush. It stayed long enough to be photographed. These beautiful little creatures are so well camouflaged and so shy that they are seldom seen. Then a strawberry patch yielded a hatful of fruit and I carried them along to Matt's Valley lean-to and stopped there to bake bannock pan bread in lieu of shortcake. At this shelter was a register supplied by Sam and Flo, Class D members of ATC. Months later they wrote that they were in the Nantahalas at the time of my passing through. Heard of me from Warden Buchanan, but never managed to be in the right place to intercept me. North of Allentown are many rock ledges. From one of these, I turned the camera toward the city across the Lehigh Valley farmlands, then down to the Never Never, the tops of trees hundreds of feet below. This gave me a strange feeling, as though I could step down and walk on the treetops, a dangerous flight of fancy. North of here are the anthracite coalfields, first discovered at Morch Chunk about 1750. Anthracite is so hard it is sometimes used for souvenir carving. Another storm threatened during the afternoon and I practically ran for several miles looking for shelter but the storm turned down a parallel valley and I stopped to camp on a charcoal flat by a spring not far from Lehigh Gap. From there in the morning I side-trailed to Palmerton for supplies then climbed the steep and rocky incline out of the gap. This definitely was not the place for a riding critter. Various people have tried to use horses, mules, donkeys and even motorcycles to traverse the Appalachian Trail but Shank's mare seems to be the only way. This was emphasised at one of the Salmon Flow registers where a New Yorker had written What are these, the Appalachians or the Rockies? My feet feel like hamburgers. Entirely different in tone was an entry by Ernest Greiser of Easton. Sun and wind and the sound of rain, hunger and thirst and strife, God to be on the trail again, with a grip on the mane of life. Wind Gap definitely deserves its name, according to a man I met there. He said that air currents are channelled by the terrain so that a wind blows on the calmest day. The four-lane highway is the southern gateway to the Pocono Resort region, known for its lakes and waterfalls. As usual, I had to scurry across that highway to avoid the cars and trucks zooming over the crest. 
Speed limits are always too high at such places and seldom are enforced anyway. East of Wind Gap was the nastiest predicament on the trek. Inchworms, larvae of the gypsy moth, were literally stripping the foliage from an entire forest of chestnut oak. The pesky things were everywhere, swinging on webs from every twig, crawling on the ground, up my pant legs, into my eyes and ears. They couldn't even be brushed off without squashing. It took me four long hours to get through the infested area. The plague of the gypsy moths is gradually spreading across the country, in spite of spraying and other attempts at control. The trail became narrow and rocky for a few miles before coming to a rock ledge overlooking the Delaware River. Tammany Mountain loomed high on the New Jersey side. This peak, named for one of the Delaware chiefs who signed the treaty with William Penn, features a curving rock stratum. This helps to explain an Indian legend that the area to the north, toward the Poconos, had once been a large lake held by the mountain, which finally broke. They called this region the Minisink, meaning the water is gone. I slept on the ledge in hopes of a sunrise picture over Tammany Mountain, but cloud conditions were hopelessly dull in the morning. William Penn got along well with the Indians, sometimes staying with them for days. He enforced treaty boundaries and punished offenders. His heirs changed that. When negotiating a treaty to acquire the land as far as Blue Mountain, using the usual day's walk, about 20 miles as measurement, They hired a man named Marshall who walked twice as far despite Indian objections and claimed the land far beyond Blue Mountain into the Minisink. This is known historically as the Walking Purchase, which helped bring on the French and Indian War. Eventually, the Delawares and the rest of Lenny Lenape were displaced entirely, being squeezed between the colonies and the Iroquois, the remnants fleeing westward along the Mississippi where their ancestors had lived according to tradition. A few individuals remained behind regardless. The real last of the Mohicans died in his wickiup on Kittatinny Mountain, overlooking his beloved Minisink, retaining his Indian heritage. My breakfast was cooked at a spring in a rhododendron thicket on the way down to the river. Just beyond was a small pavilion where I stopped to take a picture. A tall old man came strolling up the path, wearing dark suit and white shirt, straight as a ramrod and swinging a beautiful blackthorn cane. He said he had been coming to Delaware Water Gap for more than 50 years and still considered it his favourite resort. He spoke of many places, having travelled much of Europe and North and South America. My own travels in the Pacific during wartime interested him greatly. As we started down the path together, he quoted scripture. Young men shall see visions, old men shall dream dreams, adding, I come here to dream. When we came to the side path leading to his hotel, he raised his hand and turned away with a softly spoken Vaya con Dios, the old Spanish farewell. The resort at Delaware Water Gap, with its waterfalls, its rhododendron gardens and its scenic ledges, was a very popular place in the past years. Chartered trains carried hundreds and even thousands of people on weekend excursions at speeds comparable to highway speeds of today. The difference in cost and fuel consumption and the greater margin of safety are easily imagined. In those days, such scenic places as Watkins Glen, Penmar and Delaware Water Gap were widely known and discussed. At the road next to the river, a man sitting on a porch said the nearest bridge was about five miles downstream at Portland. He suggested I wade across, that the water would scarcely reach my knees. One glance at that wide expanse convinced me otherwise. Somewhere out there was a channel. Needing colour film, which wasn't available in the local store, I caught a bus to Stroudsburg. On the way back, I hitched a ride with a war veteran named Schillereff. He told of being one of the only seven men who survived when his ranger battalion was ambushed and massacred by German tanks in Italy. The seven were away on patrol at the time. He took me right on through to Portland, where the bridge was the type often pictured on calendars. It was a wooden, covered bridge of the style seen in New England and Pennsylvania with massive hand-hewn timbers, arched span supports and protective roof and siding. Now to one of the corner posts was a metal AT marker. My battered old boots thudded softly on the heavy planking as I crossed to the Garden State of New Jersey.